welcome, science fiction fans, to another installment of That Sci-Fi Guy. This time, I thought I'd take some suggestions from the viewers. Battlefield Earth. Eh, the Nostalgia Critic already did that one. Uh, Armageddon, that'd be... No, Nostalgia Chick already did that one. Uh, let's see, Volcano? Eh, no, that's kind of more sci, less on the fi. Uh, let's see, Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within? Seriously? What do I look like, that fantasy guy? Okay, so this movie came out in 2001, and was marketed as having the most photorealistic, computer-generated effects ever. It didn't really live up to the hype, but it was very technically impressive for the time. The problem was that they hadn't really figured out how to render the texture of human skin yet. Instead of using multiple translucent layers like they did in the Ang Lee Hulk movie, they just opted to cover up any free patch of skin with as many freckles, moles, and pock marks as they could. I think it still holds up pretty well, but it just didn't deliver on what it promised. I mean, it's no Benjamin Button, but these characters do look at least as good as the younger Jeff Bridges and Tron. We're always on the same team. Aside from the matte painted skins, the movie is pretty cool looking, and you can tell it had a huge impact on sci-fi projects that followed, especially in gaming. These Gears of War suits are a lot like the armor seen in this movie. And it's clearly where the Omni tool came from. Mass Effect's art director, Derek Watts, was even quoted as saying, We actually reference a lot from Final Fantasy The Spirits Within. I keep a folder of that stuff, and I still actually tell the guys, Just go back and look at that. Change it like that. If nothing else, these glowing user interfaces and hologram projections definitely make this movie memorable. Eye candy aside, this just wasn't that great of a movie. It suffered from seriously lazy storytelling and piss-poor characterization, making a lot of it confusing and pointless. You spend most of it just trying to figure out what the hell is going on. As opposed to some made-up world, the movie is set on Earth in 2065, immediately dating itself. Do you really think we're going to be living in a post-apocalyptic world with force field domes and giant orbital space stations in, like, 50 years? I know the setting of the not-too-distant future is corny and all, but it keeps you from looking silly when things don't exactly pan out that way. First, we're introduced to our main character, Aki, who only seems to have a personality about 10% of the time. The rest of it is just generic, the girl. She is on a mission to retrieve... something, when the rest of the supporting cast drops in, wearing 100% identity concealing helmets. Once they retrieve the... plant she was apparently after, they escape our first run-in with the movie's villains. Invisible aliens called Phantoms. Word, bitch. Phantoms like a mall fucker. Once safely back on the ship, everyone takes off their masks and we actually get to meet them. Let's start with our hero. Gray. And the name certainly fits. He's nice that boring. It's like the writer said, Here, I made a character. His name is Gray. And then walked away from the table! Yeah. Nice to see you too. Guy has no background whatsoever. We're simply left to infer what his relationship was with Aki, and ultimately we have no reason to care about him. Ironically, the secondary characters have more personality than the principals, and that's just because they fit into the commonly used archetypes. Look, hero and girl are already covered. We've also got the black guy played by Ving Rames. The weird looking geek isn't really weird looking, but he is voiced by Steve Buscemi, so I guess he's played by somebody weird looking. Like I say, he was funny looking. More than most people, even. Aha. Uh -huh. In what way? Oh, just in a general kind of way. Rounding out our A-Team, Super Squad, Planeteers, Mickey Mouse Club, whatever, is a straight-up clone of Vasquez from Aliens. Hey, Vasquez, have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? She thinks you're a man. I think she's an idiot. I know you're not a man. I think you're an idiot, too. <laughs> and the douche? Jesus! The guy is a walking montage of dirty looks from villains in other movies. He's an engineered amalgam of everything people associate with evil looking. He's even played by James Woods. And like everyone else, he suffers from a major lack of characterization. Okay, there is one scene where he tells us that his wife and kids died, but this is a post-apocalypse. I'm sure everybody has lost family. We have no reason to understand what motivates him, why we should take him seriously, or again, care at all. When you half-ass a badass, all you end up with is bad. Or ass. 
As the away team is clearing quarantine, the movie shows us just how much of a threat these ghost-like aliens are by having everyone panic when their captain is infected. Oh shit! They're forced to break quarantine and quickly perform a suspense-filled pseudo-surgery sequence. It's difficult to follow what's going on. What the hell is going on? But at least it's pretty. And finally, we're introduced to Sid. About the only thing this movie does have in common with the games. Actually, the character Sid from the Final Fantasy role-playing video game is spelled with a C, whereas the name of Dr. Sid here is spelled with an S. So they didn't even get that right? Ugh, whatever. As the movie continues, they explain Sid discovered energy emitted by the Phantoms 20 years ago. He also found that the same energy existed not just in Phantoms, but in all life forms. And he was able to harness it. For oval packs, scanners, even the barrier. The His research and discoveries became the foundation of this world's technology. And now that we have the characters, it's time to start the movie's conflict. Mr. Evil Man has plans to rid the planet of these phantoms that involves shooting a giant laser into the meteor crater that appears to be the source of the infestation. Dr. Sid, however, believes this to be a waste of time. Now, please note the phantoms outside the meteor are indeed destroyed. However, inside, many that were dormant come to life, and as you see, overall phantom density remains the same. And that's why the Ghostbusters had a containment grid. And not only that, it could cause severe damage. Injuring the Earth. Well, that sounds like a good enough reason not to, you know, fire you a mean giant... The Gaia. I mean... You mean the spirit of the Earth? No, I mean something scientific, like... I don't know, it might throw off the rotation of the Earth's core or something. Yes. The spirit of the Earth. What?! You dumb son of a... Why would you answer it like that?! What are you doing? I know what I'm doing, and whatever you do, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> right. When the Council says that the Gaia theory is still unproven, and that they're running low on options, the doctor explains his plan. As we know, the aliens display a distinct energy pattern. Now, it is a fact that two opposing bioetheric waves placed one over the other will cancel each other out. It is theoretically possible to construct a wave pattern in direct opposition to the phantom energy. Well, that seems like a pretty sound scientific theory. To me, that reasoning sounds concrete, solid, I'd even call it Starfleet. Given that, maybe you want to reconsider firing the giant laser into the planet. Too bad Dr. Sid didn't present it that way and leave out all the spiritual stuff like he just warned Aki about in the last scene. Our ideas are unpopular, Aki. If you have any notes or records that could be used against you, destroy them. Instead, Senior Douche takes advantage of the fact that everyone is in such a state of denial about spirits to further his own agenda. It offers no solid evidence that it will destroy the alien. Um, except the part where he said that opposite wave patterns have been proven to cancel each other out. Was I the only one awake for that part? I mean, I just don't understand the blind ignorance here. These things exist in this world. They are scientifically measurable. This isn't fantasy. If the ionization rate is constant for all ectoplasmic entities, we could really bust some heads. In a spiritual sense, of course. So that cluster of bad writing leads us pretty much to the rest of the movie. I'm scanning the city for the seventh spirit. A quest to find the seventh and eighth spirits to complete the wave they need to neutralize the phantoms. Oh boy, an item quest! Are they gonna have to grind before they can get it? But, you know, really, I just don't understand why they have to hunt for these things. I mean, if they have a blueprint, couldn't they feed the data into a computer and just create the wave they need? That's just sloppy storytelling. What is the point of all this? I mean, why go on this long... Really? Am I harping? Okay. Our heroes set out to find the seventh spirit. Time to go play outside again. And now that they've been introduced, the main characters no longer need the identity concealing helmets. Instead, those are left for the obvious red shirts. You know you're expendable when you don't even get your own render. Dude, I'm only a hundred thousand polygons! I'm dead for sure! They drop these things called energy buoys to distract the phantoms. Whatever they are, it keeps them at bay long enough for our party to retrieve the seventh spirit. It's not the soldier, it's his overpack. How do you explain that? The packs power our weapons, the barrier cities. I mean, it's just bioetheric energy. And to create that energy, we use living tissue, single cell organisms. Okay, wait. The stuff is called bioetheric energy? Then why is it so far-fetched for people to think that this is a plausible plan? 
I mean, people seem to shun the idea that their power stores, called bioetheric energy, has any sort of bearing in... Moving on. After they've gathered the item for this quest... It's time to escape the big monsters. And for some reason, something is attracting the phantoms away from the... Weird shit coming out of the... Things. Right to where they are. This is a pretty cool scene, because it's the first time we get to see just how devastating of an enemy these aliens really are. You know, you have to wonder, if they can kill you just by passing through you like that, then why wear armor that's so big and bulky? At first I thought Aki was crazy for not wearing armor, but really I guess all these guys are the dumbasses. Why wear heavy armor that does nothing to protect you? You'd think it'd be made of the same technology that protects their cities or something. But I guess, I don't know, maybe it has to be projected in these geometric shapes. Although if that's the case, then why not at least use that technology in their ships? When our heroes are making their getaway, one of the larger phantoms just goes right through the ship, resulting in some red shirt insta-kills. Well, I guess we'll just assume that the shielding takes more power than the ship can provide and has to be generated by something large inside the city. Speaking of which, back at Mission Control, Count Dushula has decided the only way that he's going to convince the Council to use his Zeus Cannon is to scare the shit out of everybody by doing a false flag operation. Let some phantoms in and blame his enemy. Reduce power to sector 31. Sir, you do realize that the phantoms... What I realize, Major, is that we must force the Council to take action against the enemy. Brilliant. There's no chance that could backfire at all. Sir, I have numerous phantom contacts. Well, of course you do. Outside of Sector 31, sir, and moving at incredible speed. Major, what the hell is going on here? They're in the pipes. They're moving with the bioetheric energy flow. That's impossible. No living thing could survive in those pipes. Well, isn't that interesting? The aliens that you call phantoms that seem to be made of pure energy are traveling through something that no living thing can survive in. Hmm. Well, if they're not alive, then they must be ghosts. But you don't believe in those, so you've got nothing to worry about. While General Douche is off doing stupid things, the rest of the cast, now imprisoned by the General, discuss Aki's dreams and realize the relation between the different phantoms. What friggin' relationship? I mean, you got your human-sized phantoms, and your creepy caterpillary phantoms, and your flying phantoms, and let's not forget my personal favorite, the big fat giant phantoms. Down, boy. They finally deduce that these aliens are not actually an invading force, but instead rode in on a meteor that cratered here years ago. The meteor is a chunk of their planet that got thrown into space when they destroyed their world. But how could they survive the trip across outer space on a hunk of rock? They didn't. Well, duh! You mean to tell me these scientifically quantifiable energy signatures are sentient spirits? Wow! Meanwhile, the invasion of the station triggers the emergency system, which just happens to include releasing our heroes from the brig. Proceed to the nearest evacuation facility. Proceed to the nearest evacuation facility. I think we should proceed to the nearest proceed evacuation the facility. Nearest eva because of course, every emergency system should involve releasing dangerous criminals. It's an emergency! You know, someone could get hurt or something. This act also results in some of the best action of the movie including this particularly badass scene where one of the flying phantoms goes right through the cockpit of an aircraft, causing it to crash. Something about this scene is just really cool. They also get points for this bit, where they're forced to jump their vehicle through an industrial complex and come crashing down. It totally wrecks the car. And one of the passengers is mortally wounded. Nice job making their actions actually have consequences. Anybody hurt? Captain! Oh, God. Talk to me, Sarge. Uh, ouch! But why didn't that thing have seat belts? No seat belts, armor that does nothing, no shielding in their ships. Nobody cares about protection in this movie. I guarantee you, not one of them has a condom in their pocket. And did it have to be the black guy that gets it here? Our movie's not over the black dude dies first trope. Well, at least in modern movies, the black guy gets to die heroically, instead of just being cannon fodder. So after all this, they just dispose of the characters no longer needed for the plot and move right into the climax. 
Huzzah! The final spirit has been located! And in a somewhat unlikely place. The eighth spirit is a phantom spirit. I can't explain it at the moment, but once we get down there... Wait, I, I still don't understand why they have to hunt for these. I mean, why not... Okay, okay, jeez. Gray argues that this is a suicide mission and that there has to be a better plan. But he's outvoted by Aki and Dr. Sid, so our heroes set course for the impact site. Meanwhile, the evil James Woods has decided that allowing the city to be destroyed just isn't douchey enough. So he sets course for the Zeus Cannon, and it's like we're suddenly in the end of the core, with the good guys working against the odds while being fired at by a giant weapon. The target, sir? The Phantom Crater. When they reach the site, Gray and Aki are lowered into the crater in some kind of vehicle. Powering the shield. Now wait just one damn second. You mean to tell me they actually have small portable shields? And just where the hell have they been this whole movie? Why aren't these things installed on every ship they have? Or at least around the cockpit to prevent this from happening? Everyone's bathroom should have that fucking shield. Oh, and not just that. But this ship seems to be specifically designed to be lowered into a giant crater. Why? Who came up with this? Hey Bob! Ah. Bob, I created this awesome shield generator! I think we should install it on one of our critical ships! Uh, no, no. Clearly, we should attach it to a platform with four wenches, each containing miles of cable. Uh, no offense, Bob, but when would that possibly be useful? I don't know. Act three? <sighs> Anyway, once the ship is in closer scanning range of the Phantom, they confirm that it is indeed the last piece that they need to complete their wave. It's a match. It's a perfect match. Seconds before the Zeus cannons fired at them. Fire. Oh, I hope that didn't delay the end of the movie. The Eighth Spirit has been destroyed. Oh my, I am shocked. This is my shocked face. As El Duche continues to fire on the crater, uh... Tetsuo from the end of Akira breaks through the surface, I guess, and knocks the pod into the crater, trapping them. It's here they discover that Tetsuo is actually the phantom counterpart of Earth's Gaia and is bound to that meteor. It turns out when one of the phantoms encountered our Gaia, it was transformed into the final spirit. And since they're in the middle of Spook Central, all they have to do now is wait for it to happen again. Aki. Uh, what the hell is going on? Is the Phantom trying to escape from her chest? So wait, are they implying that the final spirit needed to protect Gaia is... heart? The answer lies within! Mati? But I heard you died. Of course I'm not dead, you dummy! Anywho, death is only the beginning, and only heart can join the spirits of two worlds! Maybe you can explain to me why they have to go hunting for these spirits when they've got the blueprint for the wave pattern that they need. Yes. What? Because you must hunt for the spirits! But it's a freaking wave, made of, like, bacteria or something. I mean, can't they just make the right bacteria no! in the lab? That defeats the purpose of the journey, because there is no heart in technology! Yeah, that doesn't really explain anything. Now that I've laid all of your claims to rest, I must get going now. But I've learned nothing! The spirits within are calling me. Don't worry, wherever there is heart, there is my tea! I see now. I understand. Well, I don't understand. Uh, yeah, you and me both, buddy. So they found the final spirit, and surprise, surprise, that opposite wave that was a proven fact works. Aki then uses the... shield to transmit the wave, which instantly starts dissipating phantoms. Of course, douchey McDouchebag just has to get a few more shots in, which breaks their only method for transmitting the wave. Get down! Warning. System overload. I know! Warning. System I know. overload. Warning. System overload. But it must be done. Warning. Why? Well, I guess because according to the internationally recognized code of the douche, 
he must be directly responsible for his own death. Well, now that the asshole is dead, we can finally get this movie done with. So seeing as Aki has the completed spirit wave in her chest, they decide to... sacrifice Grey to... use as a conduit to transmit it to the alien Gaia? What? Yeah, that makes sense! You know what? Screw it! Clip of the day! You know, it's just occurred to me we really haven't had a completely successful test of this equipment. I blame myself. So do I. Well, no sense worrying about it now. Why worry? Each of us is wearing an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back. Yep. Now let's get ready. Switch me on. This is an automated pre-recorded video, because I knew one of you assholes was bound to review Final Fantasy The Spirits Within.